In 1885, Freud's career took a momentous turn for the better. That year, his research in neurology led him to Paris to study the problem of hysteria with Dr. Jean-Marie Charcot. Hysteria had become a catch-all diagnosis for patients who exhibited an array of physical symptoms like spastic tics and speech impairments with no known medical cause. Hysteria was widely believed to be incurable, but Charcot disagreed. Charcot felt that hysteria was not necessarily degenerative, that it was possible to think in terms of cure, and that it was a condition of psychological origin. And this is the beginning for Freud. Freud's uh, year with Charcot was really a turning point for him. The experience of Charcot was very significant for the impression it made on Freud. People under hypnosis could become aware of thoughts, feelings, fantasies, issues that they were not consciously aware of. So it gave Freud a beginning feeling for the unconscious mind. Determined to explore this further, Freud went to work with Joseph Breuer, a prominent Viennese physiologist who was also researching hysteria. Breuer had been treating a patient named Anna O oh with a revolutionary new therapy, the talking treatment. Breuer learned that bringing Anna O oh back to earlier experiences which were disturbing to her and having her relive them and talk about them, talk them out, she symptomatically made extraordinary improvements in her condition. And it was Anna O oh herself, the patient, who coined the term the talking treatment. The work of Charcot and Breuer intrigued Freud. In 1886, he opened his own practice, dedicated to treating hysteria and other nervous diseases. However, Freud's practice wasn't an immediate success. He experimented with a variety of techniques, including electrotherapy and hypnosis, but his results were disappointing. He discovered by putting a person under a hypnotic spell that you can get them to remember things that they have forgotten, uh, to make associations between memories that had not been clear to them, and uh, you can produce a temporary alleviation of symptoms, but it didn't last. And I had the further difficulty that, that it was difficult to make a determination between a person's memory and something that might be suggested by the hypnotist. And Freud became very cautious about suggestibility. Determined to avoid suggestion, ultimately Freud abandoned hypnotism and he developed a new technique based on Joseph Breuer's talking treatment called free association. For Freud, free association meant encouraging his patients to speak freely with as little censorship or guidance as possible. This process not only seemed to make Freud's patients feel better, but more importantly over time his patients' ramblings revealed to Freud their underlying conflicts. If patients like Anna O oh were allowed and encouraged to speak freely, inevitably the disturbing experiences that they brought up connected with their symptoms began to go back to adolescence and childhood. One such case was known as the burnt pudding case. It involved a woman who, as a child, had been abused by her father. Coincidentally, there was a smell of burnt pudding coming from the kitchen at the time. Years later, she was a nanny working for a family, and uh, the father was again an abusive man. One day during one of these abusive episodes, not directed at her, the cook was burning the pudding. And the combination of the intense emotional experience triggered by the recurrence of the smell brought on a hysterical symptom. As more and more of Freud's patients began recalling incidences of abuse from their childhood, Freud arrived at a bold conclusion that he would later come to regret. All hysteria was caused by sexual abuse during childhood. And Freud even went further, theorizing that unconscious sexual urges begin in infancy and drive much of human behavior. None of this sat well in Victorian Vienna. The times certainly did not favor any um, unedited, unexpurgated discussion of sex. 
Uh, that much we can say automatically. And certainly the public in Vienna, back in that time, didn't want to deal with issues of sexual molestation any more than they really wanted to acknowledge all kinds of other problems uh, inside and outside of homes. Despite his unconventional theories, Freud's own home life was traditional. Having married the love of his life, Martha Bernays, the Freuds had six children during their first nine years of marriage. They settled into a typical domestic arrangement. While Martha managed the family, Sigmund Freud was consumed by his work. Freud not only saw patients five and six days a week, uh, but he some of the patients went with him on his vacations and continued their analytic work there. I cannot imagine life without work as really comfortable. I find amusement in nothing else. Freud's analytic work didn't stop with his patients. When his father died in 1896, Freud's grief moved him to begin a process of self-analysis. In effect, Dr. Sigmund Freud became his own patient. He was his own best subject. He realized the benefit of releasing some of these subconscious issues of his own, and that felt that it was important for each individual psychologist to have worked these issues through on their own to be able to better treat the patient. In his efforts to better access his unconscious mind, Freud discovered a whole new road to the unconscious, the dream. Over time, he theorized that dreams were a place where the mind runs uncensored, playing out thoughts and memories we dare not discuss in the waking world. Freud believed that dreams could provide him with remarkable access to the repressed thoughts in his own mind, as well as his patients. Dreams were viewed two different ways before Freud. They were of fantastic importance, prophecies about the future. They were almost divine messages. They were also considered to be nonsense, just waste products of the sleeping mind. Now what Freud did was to elevate dreams into the realm of scientific observation and discovery. He showed that dreams had a meaning. 